and um, well, we're then just going to do some introductions around the room before we go live on the internet. Okay. Okay. That's me. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Um, we're going to get started with just some introductions before we um, are broadcasting on the web and some other announcements. Um, my name is Jennifer Dill. I am uh, director of the Oregon Transportation Research and Education Consortium, um, which is helping co-sponsor uh, the talk today as part of our Friday um, seminar. I'm also faculty in um, urban studies and planning, so welcome, everyone. Um, before I before we do the introductions, I wanted to also note that at 1 o'clock immediately following the seminar, actually in this room, um, is a, sort of an open house about um, eco-districts. Uh, it's being done by some of our uh, planning, part of the planning student club. So if you're interested in eco-districts, finding out what they are, learning more, stick around. The other implication of that is that um, we need to vacate this room promptly at 1. Um, and often there's a lot of lingering after the seminar. So what I would ask everyone is um, if, you know, there's still questions, et cetera, that we try to make our way out into the hallway and deal with things um, there. So, but I hope some of you will stay and learn about eco-districts. So we're going to do just, um, um, I don't know if I'm actually on the web or not. Did they turn off the monitors? Um, I don't know. They, they haven't been on. Okay. I have no idea if I'm on the web or not. Maybe ask. Um, okay, so we're going to do introduction. I am on the web? No, I need to get you seen. No. No. I am on? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I didn't know I was. Okay, so we're going to do some very quick, um, very quick introductions around the room. Um, so partly so our, cons our speaker can know the audience and also I want to remind everyone if you, and uh, tell you maybe for the first time if you haven't been here before that since we are webcasting you need to be using the microphones when you ask questions. Uh, there are microphones on most of the desks. Hold the touch, keep the red light lit while you're speaking so the people on the web can hear. Um, and we do have people who watch on the web. So um, I'm going to start and we'll go around this way uh, with introductions. And don't forget to use the microphone. <laughs> <coughs> My name is John Glebe. I'm an assistant professor in the School of Urban Studies and Planning. Uh, Jeff Owen, uh, bicycle and pedestrian planner for the city of Wilsonville and smart transit system. Ashley Hare, uh, research faculty in civil engineering. Lindsay Walker, student in the Master of Urban Regional Planning. I'm Darren Lund, a Master in Public Health student at the Portland State. Sorry. Justin Willard, a civil engineering student here. Uh, Chris Muncy, faculty in civil environmental engineering. Meg Merrick, Institute of Portland Metropolitan Studies. Kyle Johnson, intern at PBOT. Uh, Tim Morgan, an economic development professional in Portland. John MacArthur, OTREC. How Hagedorn, OTREC. So we'll start in the back with John. I know there may not be microphones back there, so. John MacArthur, OTREC. Connor Lamb, student, civil engineering. Damir Brankovic, civil engineering student. Larry Guttak, civil engineering student. Carlo Mazzano, civil engineering student. Aaron Lyad, urban studies student. Ingo, student, civil engineer. Nathan McNeil, uh, master's of urban and regional planning student. Adam Moore, student, civil engineering. Just speak loudly. Jesse Budar, uh, Portland State Research Assistant. Christy Gladhill, Master's Student in Civil Engineering. Will Farley, Civil Engineering Student. Nguyen Tara Key, Metro. 
Praneet, civil engineering student. Kave, new PhD student, transportation engineer. Civil engineering student. Bob Kellett, master of urban regional planning. Levi Roberts, master student, urban regional planning. Alex Pagazzi, civil engineering student. Roger Averbeck, neighborhood advocate in uh, transportation committee in southwest Portland. Uh, Mary Ann Fitzgerald, chair of the transportation committee for southwest Portland. I'm Ben Weber, I'm a master of urban and regional planning student. Scott Bruce, management and leadership student. Jonathan Kibrick, freelance policy wonk. Okay, great. Thank you, everyone. Um, and I am going to go ahead um, and introduce our speaker for today. Uh, we have Mel Rader, who is co-director of the organization Upstream Public Health. Um, Mel has earned two master's degrees, and I think this is an interesting combination, one in nutrition policy and the other in environmental engineering. Um, and it seems like you've been able to combine those two things well in uh, your current uh, position. He's former Fulbright Fellow and has several years of experience in the nonprofit sector working on media relations, fundraising, and grassroots um, advocacy. Um, it, at Upstream, uh, Mel coordinated the grassroots advocacy for the 2005 campaign to get junk food out of the school and spearheaded the successful menu labeling initiative in Multnomah County. And he is now um, working on some transportation related um, and health uh, connections and issues, and that's what he's going to talk about today. Thank you very much. Great, thanks. Um, glad to be here. Um, so, healthy transportation is, in the public health world, is a new hot topic. Um, that, you know, it's, there's been a long term connection between planning and public health, and it started with contagious diseases. How do we plan cities so that um, we have proper sanitation and, and um, other aspects of, to prevent um, um, contagious diseases? And then planning world and public health world drifted apart for a while, and now they're really coming back together around chronic disease. How do we prevent obesity? How do we prevent diabetes and, and other chronic conditions? through planning our cities and planning our transportation systems in a way that people get physical activity and, and, and live healthy lives. Um, so in my presentation, I'm going to start by talking about the links between transportation and health, what they are, how, how big of the magnitudes they are, um, as far as we know so far. Second, um, talk about um, a little bit of the process for how we integrate health analysis into the planning process in transportation planning and in land use planning. Um, and then third, um, I'll, I'll talk about our research project around, which is a health impact assessment on policies to reduce vehicle miles traveled, which a lot of you picked up in the reports here. Um, so some of the major impacts related to our transportation systems. First, uh, car collisions, which is an obvious one. That kills around 40,000 people a year in the US. Um, um, second, about the same magnitude is air pollution from, from vehicles, which is not, does not get as much credit or is not thought about or planned about as much as collisions, and yet it, it kills probably about the same amount of people. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has a broad estimate of between 20 and 50,000. Other estimates are higher than that. Um, and then third, is the link between transportation system and physical activity. And probably this link is actually greater than either of these two, but it's, it's also the hardest to understand and the hardest to, to, um, to really measure. Um, current expert recommendations for physical activity are that we get 30 minutes of physical activity a day. Um, through uh, a commuting options, if you commute by car, on average, people walk one and a half minutes during their commute if they go by car, versus on public transit, they'll walk on average 16 minutes between bus stops or light rail. So they can, uh, through public transit um, use, you can get almost, you can get over half of your recommended physical activity um, just through commuting. And then third, bicycle commute, you get 25 minutes, which is more vigorous activity than, uh, than walking. So you can, uh, just about meet your physical uh, um, activity requirements through biking to work. Uh, 
and that's why when we talk about active transportation is another key term, that includes walking, biking, and public transit. Public transit is an active form of transportation. Um, there are a number of studies looking at trying to assess the magnitude of, of some of the links around physical activity. And one study um, looked at, estimated um, that the healthcare costs related to obesity, um, if you, well, they compared somebody who takes public transit versus somebody who drives to work and found that if somebody who takes public transit, they estimated they would save $5,500 in healthcare costs. Um, through taking that option, or live at least six months longer. Um, just, just looking at the obesity side, not looking at heart disease, diabetes, or a variety of other health conditions. Second is um, there's also not only in terms of commuting options, there's also how we design our cities how, um, and land use options. And um, there's a clear connection between patterns of sprawl and health outcomes. Um, one study looked at uh, patterns of straw, sprawl across the country and found that it could explain at least six pounds of weight gain um, due to sprawl. So more sprawl in a city, the, the more uh, weight gain there is in the population. Um, and to put into numbers, if, if everybody who's overweight or obese in Oregon lost six pounds, that would save $206 million a year in health care costs that the state pays. So. Um, even a little bit of weight difference adds up to a lot of money in the state budget. Um, here's a graph showing from their study, looking at 25 most compact counties versus 25 most sprawling counties, and there's a difference of 2% um, in the obesity rate, which, which again, sounds like, it sounds like not a lot, but when you do the numbers, considering obesity is, is the big driver of healthcare costs right now, um, and, um, you know, big driver of, of everything that's happening in the, in the um, escalating healthcare costs and, and healthcare reform. A lot of it relates to obesity. And we can, um, one um, means of addressing that is to change our land use planning system. Uh, but in terms of, you know, health and uh, health impact analysis is a tool to achieve healthy community design and healthy community planning. So healthy community planning is broader, and it, 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 there's um, a variety of steps that, that you need to get there. I'm, and I put forward, here's a, a few steps um, that I'm suggesting that could be done um, um, to help us better do healthy community planning. So often it starts with passing policies that promote healthy design. Um, and uh, in Portland, um, we've, we've made some progress in that, in that the uh, regional transportation plan uh, for the region and the Portland plan for the first time ever put human health as a, as a key priority, a key goal for planning um, for the first time. Um, and there's, there's a variety of other policies that you could point to of things that are changing that we are prioritizing health more. Um, but once it's in the policy, then it needs to be translated into practice. And, and part of that is, is translating into the work plans of state and local agencies so that they do prioritize um, health within their planning process. Um, and we also need, third, need to build expertise within those agencies, that healthy design requires a certain rigor and a certain set of techniques that, that um, um, in addition to regular um, tr transportation and land use planning expertise. Um, and um, right now, in the region, a lot of people are talking about health and planning, but we need to take a next step of being really rigorous in that analysis um, in order to, to do healthy planning right. Um, you know, fourth is identifying benchmarks. How do we measure whether a, a community is it is, has a healthy design or not, um, and we're making progress on that. And, and then fifth, continually track our progress and reassess the goals. Um, and here's, here's one intersection. This is actually my office building, the left bank building. And I put this forward as, a, as an intersection where a lot of stuff's happening. <laughs> and um, going north-south is where there's a, uh, entrance ramp and an exit ramp for I-5 
going right through there. And east-west is, is a really uh, busy bike commute route. And in the morning, in the rush hour across the Broadway Bridge, it's just filled with bicyclists. And, um, and um, you know, and there's also a lot of people walking um, as well. And this is the left bank building is, is filling up as, a, as an office space. And, you know, I put this forward in the, to say that it's an example of where we need to make trade-offs. In order to have healthy community design, you can't just add it on to other stuff. Sometimes you need to prioritize it and change the design itself. And here, um, it has a no walking sign uh, because um, of state regulations around exit ramps that you can't put a, put a pedestrian um, walkway right there, um, even though it is really busy. And so currently, state policy trumps, um, state policy around highways trump that, um, that activity around bicycling and walking. And so, and, and that's one of the things that I feel like needs to change. And there's a lot of things, a lot of little policies you can point to um, in this manner where, um, where the physically active forms of transportation are the second tier in terms of priority. And so, um, in order to do healthy planning right, you also need to reprioritize, not just add on. Um, so some of the challenges in assessing health impacts, um, and there's quite a few challenges, but I kind of compare it a little bit to climate change impacts, in that if we're assessing the impact of a policy on climate change, what we do is we look at, we estimate the number, amount of greenhouse gas emissions with the policy versus the number of emissions without the policy, and that's the impact of that policy on, on climate change. So similarly, for health impact, we look at the impact, the n amount of death and disease with the policy versus the amount of death and disease without the policy, and that's the impact on health, whether that's a positive impact or a negative impact or some combination of the two. Um, so, but in practice, you know, I, in concept, it's much easier than in practice, where in practice, it's, it's much easier to deal with things you can measure, like the amount of um, um, car use or something like that. But then the link between to get to health outcomes can be much more complex, which is why it hasn't been as part of the process as much as, as other outcomes that you can measure much better. Um, and the, the State Public Health Division is doing some work in terms of identifying benchmarks um, to be used for healthy community design. And they've gotten some funding through the Centers for Disease Control and have been going through a whole process of getting community input. And they're nearly at the end of that process. And here's some of the benchmarks that they've come up with. Um, um, you know, present of a population walking, biking, or taking public transit to work. And that's already being measured. And that's because in this case, walking and biking are both the environmental option and they're the healthy option. And there's no additional measure needed to look at health. Um, you know, ratio of miles, bike lanes, etc. cetera. Um, some benchmarks that aren't being used now um, might be around um, land use planning and um, in the area of access to food or placement of, of, of um, key institutions. So um, one, one index that the public health world has used a lot is the Retail Food Environment Index, which is a measure of access to healthy food in neighborhoods. It's defined as uh, the number of fast food outlets plus the number of convenience stores divided by the number of grocery stores plus the number of farmers markets. Um, so it's a, a good measure of um, access to fruits and vegetables and other healthy foods. Second area is, is um, perhaps distance and safety of access to K-12 schools. Schools um, um, have, have a really important role in health for a variety of reasons. Um, um, first, the placement of schools does impact climate change in that um, whether a school is placed in the inner city or out in the boondocks has a significant impact on the total driving that's um, happening within a community. 
Um, so it relates to air pollution and other indicators. Second, um, within the health community, one of the things we really want to do is promote physical activity, especially among kids, because when you get kids physically active at critical ages, then they tend to have more active lives um, for the rest of their lives. And so placement of schools and creation of uh, walk to school and bike to school routes are important health outcome. So health impact assessment is a tool that's being used um, now quite a bit, especially in Europe and Canada and Australia, and is beginning to be used within the United States, either as a part of the environmental impact assessment process or as a standalone analysis. The World Health Organization defines it as a combination of procedures, methods, and tools by which a policy program or project may be judged for its potential health effects on a population and the distribution of those effects within a population. And I want to pull out three things here. First, it's a combination of procedures, methods, and tools. It's, it's, um, there's not a specific prescription for how to do a health impact assessment. There's more guidelines and more um, tools that you have in order to try to assess the impact of a policy or project on health. And uh, the analysis is different for different types of, of, of projects or policies. You know, second, um, whether, if you're looking at a policy, which is more abstract versus a project, which is more concrete, literally and figuratively, then um, those analyses are also quite different. And there's different conclusions you can get from those. And then the third thing I want to mention is health impact assessments not just look at the impact on health of the population as a whole, but also pull out specific subpopulations, those that are negatively affected or perhaps exceptionally positively infected, affected, and um, um, look at those impacts on subpopulations and may recommend mitigation strategies to reduce those negative impacts. Uh, so there's five steps in doing a health impact assessment. First step screening is you decide whether to do a health impact assessment or not. And so that, and that in that process, you determine the value of the health impact assessment and um, whether it will get used when it's done. Second is scoping, uh, which determines the extent of the analysis, which is based on not only resources, but also um, a, provisional assessment of what are the key health outcomes you want to look at, which are the important ones, and what are the subpopulations that you want to look at. Uh, third is the assessment stage, which is really the, the, the bulky research analysis stage of health impact assessments. Um, and it can use a combination of qualitative and quantitative methods. Um, ideally, you want to be more on the quantitative side, but in practice, uh, most of the health impact assessments are very qualitative in nature. And that's because it's, um, it's, it has been particularly difficult and resource intensive to really get to the level where you can say, you know, this policy or project will create this, you know, increase the asthma rate by this percent and have this much um, increased health care costs or something like that. Um, so um, I think eventually, uh, the field will move there, but um, it will still take a while. Uh, fourth, um, reporting of the results, um, disseminating the results to key stakeholders and decision makers, which has been, in the project I did, has been, I think, the most critical stage. That um, health impact assessments, since they're new, they're, they are kind of exciting and trendy, but they are, they're also somewhat unknown and some people can be suspicious of them. So the key is how do we get those reports off the shelf into the hands of decision makers and affect outcomes on the ground. And then finally, the evaluation and monitoring stage, which is important in any research project. Um, so in the health impact assessment we did, there were really three objectives. We wanted to inform the policy making process around um, setting targets for vehicle miles traveled in the state. Second, we want to increase the use of health impact assessments um, um, for a variety of topics. And third, we want to move forward um, health, the, the process of, of healthy planning in transportation and land use planning. Um, 
So vehicle miles traveled in Oregon have, they increased dramatically from 1970 to 2000. Um, and um, there's been a lot of population growth, but even with population growth, it's increased per capita VMT during that period. Um, and then since around 2003, um, since gas prices went up a lot, you know, about the time of Hurricane Katrina, that um, VMT has leveled off and is now going slightly down for the last seven years. Um, nationally, total VMT is going down, has been going down for the last like three years. Um, so that's a pretty significant difference in the trends around uh, vehicle miles traveled. Um, and um, in Oregon, in the 2009 legislative session, the governor proposed as part, in order to meet greenhouse gas emission targets, um, that each city should set targets for the total vehicle miles traveled um, and have integrated plans in order to get there. Uh, so, um, and part of that analysis was coming from the fact that Oregon has made a commitment to address climate change through greenhouse gas emissions. But the analysis shows we can't th get there just through fuel efficient vehicles and um, we also need to change the, this, the, our cities so that people drive less. Um, in thinking about what's the connection between climate change and health, a lot of the research is focused on the direct or indirect um, impacts, um, so, uh, which are potentially very big, that climate change um, has direct impacts on, the, uh, on health through changes in the weather, and that, that might mean increased heat stroke, it might mean increased extreme weather events, flooding, hurricanes, um, well, as well as increase of contagious diseases. Um, and then there's a variety of indirect impacts on, on health through broad social and economic disruptions. For example, um, you know, when we're looking at Bangladesh being flooded and, and about two thirds of the land area of Bangladesh being covered in water with climate change in not too long of a distant future, then there's a displacement of, you know, m nearly 100 million people, which has, you know, broad implications <coughs> in the world. And uh, many of them affect health in, in that region and in, and in the world. Uh, so those are all really important health impacts, but that's not what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about the co-benefits that in addressing climate change, um, we also have the opportunity to promote health through other activities. Um, and you can think of it this way, that the, the, our relationship with the automobile has had two large negative impacts. It has had climate change and it has promoted a more sedentary lifestyle and a wide variety of chronic diseases associated with a sedentary lifestyle. Um, so by changing our relationship with the automobile and changing our cities and so on, we're both addressing climate change and we're promoting more active lifestyles and we're getting a handle on um, the obesity epidemic, the di diabetes epidemic, and, and other chronic diseases. Um, in our analysis, we had an advisory committee. Um, so I coordinated the project um, at Upstream Public Health. Uh, the bulk of the analysis was done by um, researchers at the Oregon Health Science University, Yvonne Michael and Leslie Perdue. Um, and we, Human Impact Partners, which is a group out of California, served as an advisory role to the, to the project. Um, and then we had a technical advisory team um, which included, um, well, include both technical experts and community or organizations to advise on the project, which included staff from the metropolitan planning organizations, um, a couple of them around the state, uh, from experts at the Department of Human Services, um, from the Department of Transportation, several health nonprofits, and several bicycle and, and pedestrian um, advocacy organizations. Um, in the analysis, we looked at, we did a very comprehensive literature search, um, and uh, we decided to, to look at policies in three broad categories. First, 
uh, positive changes to the built environment or land use planning. Um, second, we looked at access to public transit um, and policies related to that. And the third, policies that increase the cost of driving. And the health impacts we chose to look at were you know, kind of the big three, Phys changes through physical activity, changes through air pollution and collisions. Um, there were some that we um, considered and, and discarded, like um, access to goods and services and the impact that has on, on health, um, for example. Um, because we, we thought they weren't as significant or they were much harder to measure. So the policies we looked at related to urban design, um, to land use included increased density, um, both residential and employment density within a city. We looked at mixed use developments, so co-locating um, employment and housing primarily. Third, looking at investing in bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure. Fourth, um, creating desirable destinations like parks or other, other spots where people wanted to go to. And then fifth, increasing street connectivity, making it easier for people to get across town through uh, smaller streets. In the category of pricing mechanisms, increasing the cost of driving, we looked at a congestion pricing um, mechanism, which is um, really related to the time of day, um, tolls related to the time of day or going into a city. Um, second, we looked at a proposal around uh, a VMT tax itself, which, Im which involves putting a little chip in, com in cars to measure how far they've gone and taxing people related to that. So third, looked at a fuel tax. Um, and then fourth, employee parking fees, which are fees um, collected by businesses um, parking in the city. And then finally, in the area of public transit, we looked at the coverage area of public transit, what happens if we increase that coverage area, and then what happens if we do promotional activities around public transit. So this is a diagram um, of it, which kind of maps out the health impacts. And I'm not going to go through this diagram because there's a lot in there. Um, but um, just want to say that there are, here are the policies on this row, and then they impact what we call the proximal impacts here, which are the more direct measurable impacts. And then those will impact health outcomes on the end. <coughs> so for example, uh, street connectivity, increasing street con connectivity has been shown to both increase active transportation, increase walking and biking, and it also is shown to decrease driving. And so increasing walking and biking um, you know, has a, a very broad range of health benefits. The more physical activity you get, um, the, more, the less heart disease, the less stroke, the less cardiovascular mortality there is, less cancer, and so on. Um, versus decreasing driving pathway has a different impact, um, which um, is related to um, primarily through changes in air pollution and um, associated respiratory illnesses, lung cancer, and so on that, that can be decreased through decreased air pollution, as well as a pathway through changes in car collisions. Um, so, you know, here's a pathway for related to the, to the cost mechanisms, pricing mechanisms. Um, and um, I'm not going to walk through this because it's just a little complicated on the screen. But if you have any questions about this, we can go back to it and, and pull a few pieces out about the policies. Um, so in the data collection stage, um, one of the things we looked at was sprawl. And I mentioned sprawl has a, there's a big correspondence between the amount of sprawl and, and weight. Uh, so, and one measure um, of that is the uh, sprawl index. Um, um, and so Multnomah County, it, the sprawl index is 131 versus New York County is 352. The bigger the, the number, the less sprawl. So um, you can think of this in that Multnomah County is, is 
a little bit more than one third the density of New York City. Um, and they associated, you know, the more, the less sprawl, then you see the higher levels of physical activity, lower body mass index, less traffic fatalities, and less pedestrian fatalities. Um, one of the policies that really was highlighted that seemed really interesting was the business parking fees. Um, and that was one of the few policies where um, it really showed a pretty significant um, shift away from driving toward alternatives um, like public transit, walking, and biking. Um, and in general, the pricing mechanisms kind of um, work the way you would think, think logically in that um, the VMT policy, um, which is related directly to the amount of driving, tended to decrease the amount of miles people drove versus the fuel tax had less of a direct impact on the amount of driving um, because of the factor of, of buying more fuel efficient cars. So that the, the impact got divided between those two uh, factors. Um, and, um, but in parking fees is essentially, you know, one fee um, based on whether you commute by car or whether you commute by something else. And so in that sense, it did promote more shift away from, from driving commute to other options. So we estimated that if there was an increased $6 employee parking fee within the city, uh, VMT would be reduced by 3,900 miles per commuter in Portland, which is, which is really major. Um, and, um, and there would be a you know, pretty significant shift away from car commuting to, toward other options. Uh, vulnerable pop populations uh, we looked at primarily included low-income communities, communities of color, um, as well as um, elderly people, disabled people, and youth. Um, and um, you know, we start with a really unequal distribution of a variety of health impacts and services, unequal distribution of air pollution impacts across the city, um, differences in affordable housing and transit access. Um, and, um, and you know, one of the things we found, especially within these, the vulnerable populations that we looked at was that, you know, increasing transit access and improving uh, the built environment, improving the design of their neighborhoods was especially beneficial for these populations. Um, and third, you know, looking at the increasing costs, it was the, were, were the policies that were most likely to have negative impacts on vulnerable populations because um, those, especially low-income people who were dependent on driving um, to work um, and didn't have any other options would be negatively impacted by that. And there's, there's a variety of um, mitigation um, strategies that were recommended within, the, within our report um, to address that. Um, including increasing public transit access in key in low-income neighborhoods, um, looking at building affordable housing in the right places so that um, you can promote more mixed-use development in low-income communities. Um, here's a, a map from that Vivek Shandas uh, uh, prepared based on some of the data from the Portland Air Toxics Assessment, and it's a uh, air quality index. Uh, for the region, and you can see kind of with the red area um, where the air quality is the worst, and it's really related a lot to how close you are to the highway. Um, certain key neighborhoods like North Portland has some of the highest um, levels of air contaminants, and, and um, areas of East Portland are pretty bad, and so there's, there is kind of a correspondence between um, exposure to air pollutants and um, low-income communities. Um, so there were a variety of trade-offs that came out um, from the analysis. Um, first, looking at you know population density. If you in increase population density, then yes, it increases physical activity. It lowers the overall pollution within a region, um, but it also increases pollution exposure within that inner city. So those that move into the inner city may be worse off. 
um, if other things are not done. And, uh, and there's some inter there was a really interesting study about this before where they looked at life expectancy of the suburbs versus the inner city in Portland um, comparing 15 years ago to uh, just a few years ago. And 15 years ago, they saw a difference of a few years uh, of life expectancy where people in the suburbs lived a few years longer um, after you controlled for all the key factors like income and, uh, and race and so on. So that people lived in the suburbs longer than the inner city. And um, over a period of 10 to 15 years, Portland really invested in, in livable communities, invested in a lot of things to make it better to live within the inner city, and that gap disappeared. So now when you control for all the other factors, it's about you live about the same length of time in the inner city versus the suburbs. Um, which to me says that you know, if we're going to invest in dense cities, we also need to invest in livable neighborhoods within the cities, and those need to go hand in hand. Second trade-off is around the pricing mechanisms. As I mentioned, they're really effective tools for reducing vehicle miles traveled, but they impact low-income uh, populations disproportionately, and we need to have good mitigation plans for that. Um, third, on the business parking fees, mentioned this is most effective tool for people getting people out of their cars, but it's also, in this case, it's the businesses that control the revenue, and um, and it's it's more difficult to create policy strategies to get those businesses to invest that re revenue in, in mitigation strategies for low-income communities um, versus if you look at like a fuel tax or a VMT tax, um, policies can affect to a certain extent how, how those, those, the, that money gets spent. Uh, key recommendations in a report was that uh, we need um, a combination of policies is best. Um, increasing population density um, and developing within the urban growth boundary, creating more mixed-use neighborhoods, increasing access to public transit, increasing the cost of driving through a variety of, of mechanisms, and then key strategies for mitigation. Uh, so next steps in VNT policy now are that um, a statewide task force was, was convened by the legislature, which has met four times, um, and they drafted legislation uh, for the 2009 legislative session, um, which, was, which is next month in February, um, to set specific targets for vehicle miles traveled for each of the metropolitan areas, which are tied to the greenhouse gas emission targets. and. Um, Metro and the State Department of Transportation would together uh, provide resources uh, for suggesting a mix of policies and a strategy for meeting those targets for vehicle miles traveled. Um, and, um, and then um, down the road, the local jurisdictions would implement those strategies. Uh, so this report got a lot of great coverage, especially nationally. And this, this comes from a report that the Council of State Governments put out. The Council of State Governments is really you know, the consortium of each of the state governments around the country. And they produce a report called Trends in America. And so the, our health impact assessment on vehicle miles traveled was highlighted as one of three trends in America around sustainable communities. And and I say that not because I think the analysis was exceptional, uh, but I think it was highlighted because it's, it's an area of planning whose time has come. That we, health is, um, it is time to integrate health into the planning process, and it's time to think about health within climate change policy. And, um, and we're really moving quickly there um, through a variety of ways. Um, Okay, that's it. So, questions? Okay, and if you don't have a microphone, I have a portable one here, too. And I'll let you point to people, too. Okay. Yeah? Um, I had a question about the, how the policies were um, analyzed. I was wondering if they were um, looked at independently or in concert with one another. Uh, yeah, good question. And generally, they were looked at 
independently, because once you get into permutations of policy, it gets really complicated. Um, and, um, and so, you know, and, and we looked at a little bit, we started to get a little bit into the mix of policies, like looking at density, because when you just look at density without looking at how that changes the city as a whole, um, it doesn't show much benefit or much, um, that much change just through density alone. Um, what's good about density is often um, how you invest resources in a city that's more dense and how you create neighborhoods in a city that's more dense and the, the, the really costs of public transit are much cheaper in a city that's denser. And so there's a lot of factors that go along with that. Um, and we didn't pull apart all of those factors. Um, the, and one, one of the topic areas that also related to this was the congestion pricing. Um, and congestion pricing can be, look very different um, depending on how you structure that. So in a city like London, they have very you know, complicated tolling mechanisms that cover the whole city at different times of day, and it's very comprehensive. And that has a very mo a much broader impact on um, physical activity and, and development than um, a tolling mechanism that might just be on one highway going to the city or something like that. Uh, yeah, Carlos. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Thank you for daring to address the planners uh, from a health perspective. But <laughs> it, it, it's great that we have this conversation on the pricing uh, uh, strategy. It, it seems very punitive. Uh, it's it, you take money from people to do something, and. It, you know, in the income curve, the, the, the rich, they could care less, they'll pay for it. And the poor, then they pay the price and they get disproportionately affected by it. Is, is, are there any articles where it's the opposite? Instead of taking money from people, we actually give money to people who do the things we wanted to do, like an incentive instead of taxes and VMTs, et cetera. Yeah. Um. Yeah, uh, good question. You know the, um, and you know in terms of the recommendations, you know meeting vehicle miles traveled targets, you know the least desirable way to get there is through a tax, um, because that does have that those negative health impacts. Um, there haven't been very many strategies of incentives uh, that I know of. Um, uh, just because it ends up being pretty costly on the, the state budget and, and um, other than um, subsidizing public transit um, more as a, you know, area. So, uh, yeah, if you have an idea or like a <laughs> policy around that, I'd love to hear it. <laughs> uh, yeah. You had mentioned about destinations, and we're interested in using scarce funds to retrofit existing neighborhoods and trying to figure out where to get the most bang for your buck to build sideways bike paths or put transit in where people will, more, the most people will use it. But you implied that schools and parks were the most desirable destinations. Then you said you did not look at access to goods and services um, because that didn't have a significant impact on health. And, I don't understand that, and wonder if you could elaborate that, and what you think about access to transit as well. Um, yeah, no, I, I wasn't trying to imply that uh, schools and parks were the most dire desirable destination necessarily. I was just using them as examples. But, um, and the reason uh, we didn't look at goods and services, um, and the, the health impacts of that um, was primarily because it was too complicated for the resources we had available to do, um, in fact. And, and there, the literature on that is, there isn't as much literature on that, and so there isn't as much proven links between access to goods and services and, and, and health outcomes. Um, and so it's difficult to do that type of analysis. Um, but, you know, logically I would think especially on, you know, access to food, access to hospitals or um, 
um, access to other key services may 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 definitely have a significant impact on on health, but it requires, I think, a more sophisticated analysis than we were able to do, which which might, I think, would really benefit from a geographic information system um, approach, um, which we did not take. Um, so, but you know, I mean, there are some some great great analyses starting to look at that. Um, from you know some of the, like the equity atlas the coalition for the future has done and some interesting work from um, Kaiser Permanente health systems where they're taking a lot of their uh, patient data and overlaying it on 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 maps of different neighborhoods and looking at sidewalks and looking at um, you know access to um, grocery stores and restaurants and all of that and so that's a really interesting work which I hope develops a lot yeah uh, you're talking about the Parking fees as a method of incentivizing. No. You're talking about parking fees as a way of incentivizing um, non-driving uses. Is it only parking fees, or the potential reduction in the total number of spaces, or the reduction in mandatory number of parking spaces within the zoning codes? Would it just be a single charge, or a restructuring of the total actual number of parking spaces available? Yeah. Well, what we looked at was just an increase in the fee at um, businesses, um, at work sites. So um, there, there have been other policies I know about changing the number of parking spaces or, or looking at changing the pricing around st street parking or other factors. And, and uh, I think all of those are, are there. They would be really interesting to look at. Um, and so, but you know that's another analysis outside the scope of our work. <laughs> it's great using that term. You know that was outside the scope of our analysis. Yeah. So, um, two questions. One is um, Oregon tried to improve or change our standards on fuel that could be sold in the state, and the federal EPA told us, "No, I'm sorry, you can't do that." Um, do you have any suggestions on how we can change that so that we can set these standards because they have horrible fuel here? And the second thing is I've been reading that there's roughly 4 million fewer vehicles on the road than there were a year ago, and there are some interesting uh, trends and in statistics as far as vehicular adoption um, for young drivers. And I'm curious if any of these... Um, studies that are going on are taking that piece of information into effect that there's starting to be structural changes in people's transportation choices. Yeah. Um, so first question around uh, fuel um, fuel content, um, and that I mean that's really interesting because probably you know a lot of people don't know that Oregon gasoline is worse. It's pretty much some of the worst gasoline in the country because. It comes from high sulfur gas from Alaska primarily. Um, so high in sulfur, high in benzene and other contaminants. And so, um, and part of that is they, they um, direct gasoline to different places in the country. And because on most of the measures of air quality, Oregon does really well. And so because of that, they kind of give Oregon the worst gasoline. <laughs> and so, in, in a number of measures that aren't part of the EPA um, standards as much, we kind of have the, pretty much the worst gasoline, which may explain some of the you know, increased risks in cancer. And um, Oregon has, has had some of the highest rates of asthma of any, country, uh, any state in the country. Um, and you know, how do we change that? Um, I don't know, but I think it needs a lot of advocacy, and we need to gain, raise awareness around the quality of gasoline and the fact that we should have, um, you know, meet a certain standard of quality for the gasoline we use, um, and not just look at a more limited number of, of measures of air pollutants within our cities. Um, and, um, you know, I forgot, what was your second question, <laughs> Brad? Uh, there's, uh, I've, I've been reading about uh, changes in transportation decisions, and they're saying that there are four million oh, right. fewer cars. Okay, yeah, um, you know, I think that does have a, that will have a big impact in how our cities look in the future. Because instead of, um, you know, growing more congested, 
we're on the trajectory of growing less congested. So, um, and we may, our cities, I think, may take advantage of that trend and really build ourselves differently and, and create kind of vibrant inner cities um, and create the kind of cities where you can get around easily on, on, um, without vehicles. Um, or we may not go down that trend, and I think that, that relates a lot to um, our, our policymakers right now. And I think, think part of the kind of analysis around health is that, that we can help to change the conversation a bit. And we can say, you know, look, here's a significant factor, you know, physical activity and respiratory conditions that are, uh, are really related to the policies people are making, and yet, for the most part, they haven't been taking those into account when, they making, when they're making those policies. Um, so I hope we can really start more of a conversation around that. Uh, yeah, in the back with the hat, yeah. So my question is, um, in the group last quarter, we looked at uh, the transportation of bikes on uh, NATO Parkway in the waterfront. We noticed that there was a, a large increase in the park versus the NATO Parkway. And basically, we, we figured that it was from safety issues. And if, if we follow what you're saying and we try to get people out of their cars, we get this large surge of bikers and walkers on the roads, how do you think that uh, we can grow our infrastructure to accommodate those people in a safer way so that they, they don't run up against safety issues versus cars and go back yeah. the other way? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I mean, in terms of biking right now, is the healthier option overall because the physical activity benefits definitely outweigh the, the increased risk in terms of collisions. But there is an increased risk of collision. It's, it's more dangerous in terms of collisions to ride your bicycle than to drive. But the more bicycles get on the road, um, we've, the evidence shows the safer it is for each bicyclist on the road. And the, and the second point is, um, on driving right now, um, the the you know it's the opposite direction, and that the fewer cars we have on the road, the safer it is for each car on the road. And so, um, moving a shift away from driving toward bicycling overall will decrease collisions both on for bicyclists and for for cars. Um, uh, but. We also, I think, you know, it's really important to invest in that bicycle infrastructure in order to, to deal with those safety issues. And, and right now there's the Portland bike plan is, is a pretty nice comprehensive plan. Um, but um, in order to get there, we need to invest the resources in order to fund that plan. Um, and they'll have to make some tough choices in terms of the priorities uh, for funding um, down the road in the region. And so, you know, if you want to get active, I would say encourage um, Portland Council to fund, fully fund the bike plan, um, which will be up for a vote next month. So I'm uh, unfortunately going to have to cut off our questions because we are about a minute to one and there's someone else coming in the room. Um, before we thank uh, Mel Rader, um, I want to put a plug in next week's seminar. Ed Fisher, the state traffic engineer from ODOT, will be talking about um, European bicycle and pedestrian planning. I hope we see some of you there. Um, and then also, there's a flyer here next week. We have a speaker coming on Thursday giving a lunch talk about uh, transportation health um, equity, a woman, um, Shireen Malikafzali, I probably didn't pronounce that correctly, from PolicyLink. Uh, encourage you to come to that. If you're a student who did not get your question asked, uh, come up to me with the paper copy. And um, thank you very much, Mel.